Hi, everyone. Welcome to Foresight's Biotech and Health Extension Group, sponsored by 100 Plus Capital. Very, very excited to have a pretty packed house today and three fantastic presenters. Just to bring people up to speed, please, if you haven't done so, and if you're interested in joining Advision Weekend 2023, which is our annual kind of end of year festival, you still have some time to do, even though they're coming up fast. The France one will be taking place in November 17 to 19. And part of the things that you'll be hearing about today are actually going to be present at that weekend. So it's a really good segue into today's presentation. And second one, the second vision weekend is in December 1st to 3rd. So if you're interested in just like meeting people across the bio, nano, neuro, space and AI tracks within Foresight and kind of plan for flourishing futures, uh, then you still have some time uh, to join these two meetings. I'm going to share more info here in the chat, but we're going to do a deep dive at the meeting and some of the topics that we'll also be discussing today. Which gives me a really wonderful time to introduce Leon to tell you what we're going to be discussing today. Go ahead, Leon. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Alison. I just want to say that today is another step towards this event that we've been planning together. It grew out of my conversation with Alison the last time we saw each other a few months ago at Foresight Conference, where I said, listen, there are all these people enthusiastic about longevity. All these people who like to experiment and measure things about their health. Why don't we actually take advantage of uh, the next Foresight Vision Weekend, where so many people get together and create some data, which is going to be shared you useful. Just I'm a little bit ahead of myself. I'm Leon Peshkin. I work at Harvard Medical School. My science is at the intersection of uh, and aging. But I'm also known as a so-called planetary genome standard, which means my personal genome is the best characterized genome on the planet, which just makes me a glorified guinea pig. But also it means that I'm very passionate about sharing radically, openly sharing my data. And I'm very interested in this sort of initiatives where people collect data together share openly and analyze the data. So whether you experiment by changing your diet or you want to see what kind of effect uh, medicine has on you, I find that surprisingly today with all the technology, smartphones and everything, it's very hard to consistently collect the data. And we're still at the level where I call my friend and I uh, ask, is this working for you? What kind of symptoms? What are you experiencing? Instead of just swapping some files, I reached out to Eduard and Michael, who are far ahead of me in terms of actually allowing people to collect and share the data. And today is going to be introducing this uh, two uh, related but distinct ways to collect and share the data and the opportunity for you to sign up for the vision event and to start participating immediately, to get these kits if you want, to collect some baseline recordings. And then when we see each other, hopefully at one of Foresight events, we will make the next step and analyze things together. And uh, I think that's probably uh, enough of an introduction. I would like to invite Michael to start and leave uh, time at the end to Edward, Michael, you are muted. Yeah, thanks. It's really exciting. It's a lot of the mission of our company is related to helping people make advances in personalized health. And so I was really happy to connect with Leon about doing something for the upcoming conference. And in general, I like Leon's no nonsense perspective on a lot of these things. So we share that. I'll pull up some slides. Now the big surprise slides, we're all dying to see it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. This is the surprise slide. So obviously longevity is getting very popular. I think it's going mainstream in many ways. There are lots of people talking about it and people listening to people talking about it. There are some people doing things about it and doing research and so on. So our little piece is blood testing. So we focus, we're very down to earth and focused on gathering data. 
this is a photo. Sometimes we do this at conferences. So this is what's contemplated for the upcoming conference. This is a photo of the Y Combinator alumni reunion where we're a Y Combinator company. So we set up like a event where people could blood test themselves recently. So we're in the scheme of longevity research and excitement around anti-aging. We're trying to occupy like the down to earth data collection part of it, but enjoy watching the rest as well. The basic premise is that there's no shortage of good ideas for increasing lifespan and health span, but there is, however, a shortage of good data. And that's really what we are focused on collecting. So we, we're a chip people. We come from this subfield of semiconductor called silicon photonics, which allows you to miniaturize optics. So we're actually, the main thrust of the company is miniaturizing a very complex blood testing tool onto a chip. There's like a, a reader and a cartridge. It looks like uh, this is the cartridge. This is the current version. We're going through an update and uh, the reader looks like this right now. So the cartridge kind of plugs into the reader. Uh, and it's a miniaturized version of a large lab tool. This technology has been very successful in telecommunications and LIDAR. So for example, like this Zoom call is going through multiple fibers on its way to you because data is transmitted over fiber. And those fibers are all connected to chips like this, which actually process the light. So we're using that same technology to, to miniaturize the optics that are used for blood testing. And we're hard at work to come out with a home device, uh, which will allow you to do what are called immunoassays at home in a user-friendly form. And there's actually a waiting list to participate in early testing of this device. That's the link there. And that'll be mostly proteins and hormones is what we're focused on. Uh, and we have lots of great partners and investors that have enabled us to do this. So we're based in near Boston in Burlington, Mass. And we have a large, pretty interesting lab. If you're ever in the area, give a tour. So what we do today is actually slightly different. This is a faster to market blood test that we decided to launch. We launched it about a year ago. And the way it works, it's slightly more conventional. So you collect your blood onto a card uh, from the finger. It's a medium amount of blood, so it's not one drop, it's a couple of drops. Uh, but people find it relatively easy to do, especially after you've done it once. And then what's interesting about this card is that it actually separates serum from bl blood cells. And this is important because all conventional blood testing equipment pretty much uses serum. So shipping whole blood, it's a very high chance of having an unsuccessful result. So even though it's, it's quite simple, this is a really good technology. It allows you to have two weeks of lifetime. So the blood can be shipped slowly. It's shipped in a dry form and then it's punched out of the card, eluded into a buffer and that's run on a FDA cleared instrument. So that's a, a commercial. Now we actually have 2000 active members in the U S and Canada that run these tests. We've run probably getting close to 5,000 blood tests. And that's 5,000 panels. So our base panel is this 17 marker panel, which covers inflammation, hormonal and nutritional balance, metabolic fitness and cardiovascular health. And then we have some expansion packs where you fill an extra strip and you get additional hormones or thyroid, for example, thyroid markers and so on. But we also allow users to connect wearables like continuous glucose monitors, or a ring, whoop, et cetera, all the classics, and about 60% of our users do that. So we actually have lots of really interesting data, which I'll go into. One thing we did differently than other companies is that this is not our long-term product, right? So we're going to a fully home-based product where you get the results in five minutes instead of five days. You don't have to mail it anywhere. And our goal was really to learn about blood testing and what impact it can have on people's health if it can be easily available. So we try to do as many markers as possible for as little cost as possible, which is not the typical model in the industry. If you buy a mail-in test normally, they're like more conventionally, what they'll do is try to sell you a separate test for testosterone and a separate test for LDL or whatever, right? Because that's, it makes a lot more sense as a business, but our goal is really to enable people to get these broad screens and then make a behavior change and see, or whatever it is, right? Take supplements, whatever they're doing, or they might already be doing something, right? That's the interesting thing in the longevity community. Most people are doing something, but they're not hundred percent sure how to know if it's working. And I myself do lots of attempt, many biohacks. And I was very frustrated over the years that I couldn't really tell if it was working besides some basic external things like weight, height, 
which doesn't seem to change no matter what I try and, and other things. But over the last year, we've done, like I said, about 5,000 tests and we have lots of interesting data. So I'll just quickly show how it looks. By the way, to uh, do five minutes on my personal user experience, if it fits with your story. Yeah, yeah. We, if you want to do it now, or I can go through what the results look like, and then you can talk about it. Here, actually, we, you should talk about your experience now, and then I'll pull up this, I'll pull up the report in the meantime. Okay, good. Let me just share my screen. Am I? Share. Okay, do you guys see my screen? That's okay. Now you should see some plots. It should update. I would maybe unshare and reshare again once you see the plot. Okay, stop share. Share screen. How is this? Perfect. Okay, good. So I just wanted to, to very briefly say, first of all, I do have an aura ring, which is coupled with that nicely. But this, I'm just logged in into my user account and I've done with this five, five data points, I've done not one, but two experiments. Uh, so first I fast once a month, I fast for two or three days, zero calories. And these two points of fasting for day and a half and two days and a half, a little bit of surprise that cholesterol goes up when I fast, right? Of course, if you think a little bit more about this, uh, when you fast, you are on high fat diet, you're just breaking up your own fat, but it, it was nice to see these two points right here. So then I generally have somewhat elevated cholesterol. I wanted to know what would statins do. So at this point, after the second uh, day of fasting, I started taking Roswell statin. And so for one month I was taking the pill and I wanted to see if it has an effect instead of going back to my doctor asking to be sent for blood work, right? I just decided when and how I want to do it. And so this point is after one month of a very basic measurement, right? But again, it's very nice to have this power to just observe what it did. All right. Again, so this is after two days of fasting, one month of resostatin. That, that's all. I just wanted to show one quick example. Back to you, Michael. Thanks. So I have a few, just a few examples of my own also. So this is unidentified 32 year old male. One thing we, it's me, but one thing we do is we actually allow you to share an anonymized version of your report. So this is basically like an encrypted link and you can send it to anybody anonymized. We also have lots of export options like CSV, PDF, et cetera, because people like to, the types of people that use this service that like to play with it. There. So we do these scores, they're like very rough estimates of what's going on, but it's more for, if you don't know much about biomarkers and don't care, you can look at, is your inflammation improving? So over the past year, we've been running the service for about a year and I've been using it a little bit longer than I've been able to slowly improve my inflammation. Having had much luck with my HRV actually that's happened. So it's actually gone down, which I'm not sure why, but it's gone down in tandem with my cardiovascular health improving. So there's, there's a lot of interesting things that don't make sense relative to the typical advice, but I'll just tell one, one story, which I, I think is funny, but you can see that actually over time, I've been able to get some of my markers more in line, which is very correlated with longevity. I've been able to get it down since I started testing, but here, let me just, this is just a, a funny story. So I have a son, three and a half year old son. And the first time my wife was pregnant, I, this Concurrently, I was co-founding this company and so on, and it definitely had a very negative effect on my health. So this time I, my wife is pregnant again, and I'm tracking this stuff very carefully. So I measured the additional like hormone panels and found that I had very high prolactin and I had measured prolactin before it's not shown here, but like on standard lab corp tests, it was in the normal range, like five to eight, I had very high prolactin and my testosterone had gone down a lot. And I Googled this. And it turns out that actually in mammals, when you have like, when the female is pregnant, somehow unknown how she actually increases prolactin levels in the male, which then inhibit testosterone production. And basically I then looked up all the biohacks for lowering your prolactin. And I took massive doses of B6 and actually got it down, which allowed me to get my testosterone, free testosterone back up to its normal levels. So you can see it back to or testosterone and whatever it is, free testosterone 0.12. Anyway, so this was like a very, it's like clockwork example of doing blood work and actually debugging yourself rather than just waiting for symptoms or something like that. Nice story. 
Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so there's lots to discuss here, but I have, I have some more interesting data rather than looking at my data. It's probably more fun to look at the population level, but it's cool to do this data fusion because you can actually start seeing, does sleep affect my inflammation? And for example, like in our data for 50% of people, sleep and inflammation is correlated versus the other 50% it's not. So if you want to improve your inflammation, working out your sleep might not have any effect at all. And this is the kind of thing where if you're looking at studies or just reading papers, you're basically looking at the average person. So it's, it's a 50, 50 shot if there's a 50% correlation. So this is just some data. I know it's like a longevity crowd. So this is just data versus age. Unfortunately, it's a little bit, a little bit, uh, the graphs are a little ugly, but some of them are pretty interesting. So obviously CRP increases with age, right? So that that's like a classic one. So inflammation increases with age. This is across the, the tests that we've done in the history. Interestingly, homocysteine increases with age. So these are brackets like 18 through 27, 28 through 37. So these are about like decade long brackets. So we see homocysteine increasing and that's a marker of cardiovascular risk. Ferritin also increases with age and that's something that it's correlated with inflammation and iron overload. So this is in males, right? It's the num the ferritin numbers are totally different in females. Triglyceride HDL ratio, we see this is our population, right? So I think what happens is people get a lot more worried about their health as they get older and they get this under control. So they start taking uh, statins or whatever, but you can see it trending up, up to about 57 years old. Let me see if I can annotate here somewhere. Is that disabled or? Yeah. Okay. I guess I can't say I like to use that tool typically. Let's see. Maybe I can do it with the, yeah. Okay. With the, with the pen. Yeah. So you see this going up and then people start taking statins or whatever and it improves. And then don't see a lot of clear data for fasting insulin. It might be because fasting insulin is just noisy because people don't necessarily like always fast for their, for their blood test. We do see an obvious trend for HbA1c. So this is the three month average for blood sugar. So this is just goes up basically monotonically with age. That's like an, an interesting one. I think there are a few more that, that are pretty surprising. So this is another one where people take statins, right? So most likely, so we don't know, of course, but ApoB rises monotonically with age in men, as does LDL, but you can see that LDL is noisier. You start getting, there are basically bigger candles for LDL and HDL is also a little bit less clear. I think in the other, so population studies show this kind of inversion curve for LDL. So basically as you, in very old patients, you'll actually see LDL dropping. That's not necessarily like a positive. Yeah. Anyway, it's interesting stuff. We're just like starting to really look at this seriously, but this is how the data looks. In the chat, Michael, you might want to look at the chat, but I will respond briefly. So all the data that Michael is showing is from the kids from the, his Cyfox company. I think I forgot to articulate very clearly at the beginning. I'm sorry that we hope that many of you will come to the vision foresight event and we will have a session Saturday evening where we're going to all take uh, a measurement together and play with the data later together. And it's good for you to start taking some baseline measurement ahead of time, regardless of your experiment, whether it's a diet or a drug, whatever you choose to experiment. And so these two kits, the time extension and Cyfox kits will be provided to you at the cost. You just essentially promise us that you will contribute the data, resulting data mm -hmm. or this body of data that we will create. Yeah, this is an important point. So we'll share, if you sign up for the, the study, the self-experiment, basically where you donate the data, you'll be able to get the test, at least for the one test before and one test at the conference. So you can do an experiment leading up to the conference. You can get those tests from us at cost, basically, and no subscription fee or anything. So we're just excited to basically if you're really going to do a careful experiment, you know, that's even better than this data because we don't really track what people are doing. We're just collecting meta on the tests as we do them. A couple of questions in the chat. So all of this data that's being displayed is from our own measurements. So it's just our, our, our customers. It's metadata from our customers. And there's a question about accuracy, right? 
So I, I recently participated, volunteered in an experiment where data was collected from the blood three different ways. Maybe you can comment on that and how things came out. How accurate are the measurements that you do with Cypher? Yeah, so it's we, we're constantly comparing these measurements to Venus draws. So there are several difficulties with doing these the Venus draw comparisons. One thing is, for example, we see things like cortisol actually increase in between draws. So you literally have to do the draw simultaneously because as soon as you start drawing someone's blood, their cortisol goes up. So you can actually see if you do three draws, you'll see like a line. The cortisol numbers look like this. But all of these tests go through, the way this works is there is an organization, federal organization called CLIA, uh, regulates testing labs. And so every one of these tests is rigorously, goes to rigorous testing to, to even launch. But we do a lot of subsequent like field testing to see the, what the accuracy is. We don't carry any markers where we're unhappy with the accuracy. The only one that we carry that constantly gets complaints is vitamin D. But the problem with vitamin D is that LabCorp and Quest don't agree on vitamin D. So every, and that's because they use different analyzers. So th this is like a real rabbit hole, but it turns out that because of the way the FDA regulates blood testing equipment, each blood testing tool only has to agree with an, one other tool. And so what they do is like Roche agrees with the last version of Roche and they've drifted apart quite a bit. So depending on which tool is used, vitamin D specifically gets, does not have agreement, especially at the low end. So you have to always test your vitamin D at the same lab if you want a really clean result. But in general, if you're outside the reference range, you'll end up, you'll, that's no matter which instrument is used, you'll see that. But if you want a really accurate within 10%, 20%, you have to test on the same instrument. Specifically for vitamin D. Which instrument will your blood dried by mail test agree with the LabCorp numbers or the Quest numbers? It agrees with Beckman. So LabCorp and Quest use different instruments, but they tend to use, LabCorp tends to use Roche and Quest tends to use Siemens. Again, for most of these numbers, that doesn't matter. For vitamin D, LabCorp tends to come in at half. So if you have a vitamin D of 60 on this test, you'll get 30 at lab. And it's not, it's just, there are two isoforms of vitamin D. There's all these reasons why this is not standardized. But the self, it's self-consistent, right? So basically, if you get sun, it's going to go up and all of that. And if you take three tests and send them all in, you're going to get similar results. But this is just the state of blood testing. Everybody complains about this at conferences to each other and so on, but it hasn't been resolved. Anyway, that's, that's, that, that's like out, out of our control in some ways because it's also regulated and we can't, for example, tell you, we predict this will be your LabCorp number or something, even though we probably could predict it. Maybe I should do one online as we go. I was planning to yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Just <laughs> yeah, we should. I don't know how much more you you have to present. We we I should. Have, I have a couple. I have a couple more slides. So there's just a few more interesting things. So DHEA is incredibly correlated with age, both in men and women. I have the female numbers here as well. So this is like really interesting. DHEAs is just to show us like a perfect correlation, which I think people don't expect. Vitamin D, this correlates with age. I think it's mainly because people might be overdosing on vitamin D supplements as they get older. Maybe they're taking, they've been taking them for a very long time or taking too much. I'm not sure. These are just my guesses, right? I'm, I'm showing you the data. You can make whatever like, conclusion you want. Testosterone seems to start going up around this age because people start taking testosterone replacement therapy. And we, we generally see four is where this is probably the bottom where you want to be most likely, maybe three people disagree, but in the past, the average male was much higher. So there's definitely something going on in the environment that's causing just a generally lower testosterone level. And obviously TSH is the higher it is, the more your brain has to stimulate your thyroid to produce thyroid hormones. So that goes up with age. Interestingly, also falls at the, towards the end of life, which I, we don't, we don't have an explanation for this. I'm just showing you our data. And this is unfortunately the plot was messed up somehow, but yeah, your morning cortisol also generally goes up with age, uh, which is interesting. So there's much more to come. These are all the correlations between different things that we measure. So that's like sleep, inflammation, everything, right? So there's way too much to discuss, but it can be the topic of another seminar and, and we'll be publishing on it and so on. So we're building a pretty big data set and we're excited to make the data available to people that can use it to to think about what to do to, to improve health and lifespan and longevity. I just want to quickly cover this topic because everybody loves to ask about this. And I just, I think this is valuable information. 
Theranos tried to make a blood count, uh, a chemistry machine. So there are three different types of blood tests where you count the blood cells, you do chemistry like ions and so on, and then an immunoassay tool. So we're, we're specifically working on immunoassays. There are a few companies trying to do what Theranos promised. So all of them are working with tubes of blood, not drops, because one of the main reasons is that blood counts don't work very well in drops, although there are some companies doing that as well. But there is a chance that some of this will happen. So all three of these companies are really serious and have lots of funding and have done some demonstrations and so on. But all of this will be in the doctor's office. So this still is not at home. So our focus is really to bring hormones and proteins into the home and assays. But actually, there are people working on delivering on the entire Theranos pitch, although much fewer markers. So Theranos, I think, was pitching 400 markers. So th these are like 20 marker type tests out of a real tube of blood. But this is, but this stuff is happening. So there's more to it than it's not just, it wasn't just like a fever dream or something like that. People are working, serious people are working on this. We um, probably can go over to Eduard at this point. Yeah. So this is just the last thing. It's, there are actually some finger prick tests that do blood counts and so on. And this is, was discussed, but these are the links for the study. You can see a video of Leon's lab where I, I did a cool video of what Leon works on combined with the discussion of the study. So you can check it out on YouTube and uh, there's a type form to sign up to the study. So that's it. thank you very much. And I'll, I'll check the, I'll check the chat for questions. Thank you, Michael. Eduard, right. you're on. You're muted. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, there's bright light coming from right behind you, which makes it a bit, okay, much better. Hi, everyone. So thank you for the invitation, Leon. I actually live in Paris, not very far from the castle. I have been in the field of life extension. I have done some research at INSERM, which is the French equivalent, French research for health. And they did center where I was and where I did a mouse lifespan tests and a lot of statistics and epidemiology. And I will go fast. So basically I was involved in longevity in Hill, International Longevity Alliance and many things like that. And I helped a lot of researchers and so I quit it researcher after some time and data and this in different fields, but that's my uh, almost a job to help the researchers with the statistics. And uh, four years ago, after testing a lot of things in mice and having insights from uh, human data analysis, I thought, okay, let's test on me. And at that time, I thought that it was relatively obvious or that I would find somewhere online a good health test. And it was a bit before the famous clocks that we see now, the ones from Steve Horvath or from Levin. And so I was looking for things in the literature. I knew that hand grip force was important because in my past, I had done a master's in, in geriatrics and in gerontology. I knew that the force of blowing, hand grip force exactly, or the force of blowing, things like that, is also very important. I know that if you can stand on one foot, and close your eyes, also very important because you have uh, very small vessels uh, next to your ears that make you uh, able to stand well. And these are things you look at when you look at old persons to know if they are healthy. So I didn't, I thought, okay, let's do something like that. So I started measuring myself with that. And I wanted, because I'm a data guy, to uh, know how to really measure things right. And I did find, I already had a lot of uh, data sets. One of them being Enhance, which is a, a yearly measure of health in the U.S. Uh, they take a panel of maybe 40,000 persons. Uh, and the good thing of that is that they follow them over time. And there is open data where you can, you don't know with who, of course, but you can uh, see, you can compare how health measures, compares with mortality 15 years later. So I could check that if people have a low hand grip force, for example, they have a high mortality, or if they have, depending on their, if they have high triglycerides similarly and things like that. So I started making my own measures and then came the papers of uh, Levin with a phenol age clock, where you measure blood samples and then you measure age, or in fact, you try to estimate the risk of dying later. And surprisingly, I had a bit different result. 
to be honest, it took me maybe one year and a half to understand. Uh, and there's a slight maybe mistake, even though what uh, Levin did is really wonderful. In the model, there is a sort of competition between age and other measures. Uh, so if you have a measure that is precise, you tend to prefer it over a measure that is not precise, where you tell you need to measure it 10 times, and maybe uh, the next day it will give another measure, if you, even if you didn't do something specific. Uh, and so in these conditions, you would prefer age, chronological age, uh, because at least it's precise. The trouble with it is that you can do nothing about your chronological age, whereas you can do a lot on your hand grip force. And so this was not taken into account in the, in the model. And for some time, I understood that this was the reason. And so with another approach that we are, we are preparing a paper and hoping to submit it for by the end of the month, but we've been working on it for two, two years. We, we have simply, I, I was a big data guy in insurance, uh, now I am now in the bank and before in biostatistics. And so what we observed is that, uh, yes, Hendrick force is important, for example, which is not the case if you use the models that currently exist or not the case if you use, for example, the Horvath's uh, clock or things like that and other things that were well known. Because of bit of time to do that. And, and then we wanted to put things together. Yes, two things. One, this is certainly not of interest to you, but it took us a lot of time to have the right measures. So we asked the Chinese builder companies that create tools and we tested like a hundred different ways to measure or even grip strengths. And it took a lot of time to really find the good products. Or for example, just to give an example, this one hurts. You need to press as hard as you can, but you cannot because it hurts. So you cannot measure your force. Things are as stupid as that. Okay. So now this is one thing. And the second thing is now that we have that. So we have a clock that is able to predict mortality rather well. So typically if we compare with, with for example, is the pheno age clock, it predicts mortality better. And one of the reasons, very probably we speak simply, or that's my belief, it's because we're measuring functional health. And the functional health is closer to death than chemical health, not always. And of course, functional health is only one part and you can combine. So typically I was interested in doing, at the beginning, we're starting with a different set of markers. Not only, maybe I shouldn't, can share my screen to make it more interesting. Oh, can I need to be allowed, right? Yeah. Then? I need to share the oh, my screen, that's fine. Oh, I need to choose this. Okay. So we'll choose this, for example. Okay. So this is... I like there was much time. Okay. So I will just go fast. On hand hands, you have a lot of markers and they go up and down with age. Some of them, they go up, for example, but the fact that the marker is up or down has almost nothing to do with, with risks of dying later. Uh, some of them are stable uh, on average over a population, but it, it matters. So it's not just because it goes up and down that it matters. It, we really need to see the correlation of the value with mortality and then the correlation across markers. So this is what we did. And so we have good results and it's going to be published. And then the difficulty was to find how to not measure yourself during uh, many hours, because for some time I was measuring myself every month and it was taking me two hours and with time and just I have to eliminate, and now we have 12 markers and within 15 minutes, you can measure your health. I have no proof in the data that I have. I cannot have the proof that if you start jogging the next day, things will improve. I did it for myself, so I know it works. And also based on the literature, you do know that, for example, the three main things I told you, equilibrium, hand grip force, and pulmonary expectatory force or move as you improve the health of an old, older person. And I can say it's true starting at the age of 30. So we have evidence for some aspects. For the rest, we don't know yet, even though you have my uh, experience or the experience of my family and friends. So that's where we are today. So this tool here, this is just an image. We have more than that. But basically, these are essential things. If you want to measure health, it looks quite very basic. It's not high tech because I didn't have the high tech uh, tools of uh, Michael. And so we made it a, a low price. So, so really we, we may lose a bit of money, but that's fine to start for you. And my goal is that we test things 
So the normal price is 100. And because in our board, we have been a lot helped by O'Brien, actually, by the, the Bray and also Brian Kennedy and, uh, and a few others, but these are them. For those who want uh, for uh, 10 more euros, we provide a t-shirt with a tight extension supported by O'Brien and a nice picture of O'Brien. And we give even more money to the Life Extension Velocity Foundation to help him rebound and rebuild and build the, the future. So of course we, we lose money, but that's fine. That's our engagement. And that's it. I don't want to take too much time. We are ready now to sell the kits. Can you comment on collecting and sharing the data that people... Yeah. So we have an app that is not yet launched. It runs on my computer and on some associates and uh, the data Wonderful. And so the data is, you, can, you have a box where you, you say, uh, my data is private or my data is public or my data is a tool research asking for analyzing it. And in the research definition of researcher, we say it's anyone who has contributed to a peer reviewed article. So it's extremely wide because we didn't want to, to make it too narrowed and we still wanted people to feel it's okay. So that's where we are. Maybe I should say it's not part of time extension, but uh, with uh, some friends, we will have uh, soon some placebo control supplements. And so I'm hoping that people can buy both. I mean, one will be labeled A, one will be labeled B. You take A during one month, B during the next month. You measure yourself so you, are, you don't know what you take. And at the end, you can ask on a website what you measure. So I hope that things like that will develop because that's the goal. I'm trying to go fast because I'm also we are short. Yeah, wonderful. We have a ton of questions already. Are you ready for them? Okay, I'm going to stop sharing for now, but feel free to any one of you just share whenever you want to share, show anything that would help. Okay, we have a ton of them. So first one, we have Cosmo. If it's irrelevant, please unmute now. Otherwise, I'll go down the list. He, he answered my question in the thread and, and indeed he is using micro resonator whisper gallery mode sensors, which I am a total nerd for. So awesome. Okay. Glad you're happy. Carl, you're next. How long, what's the expected time frame to the Admoon blood sensor from Cyfox? The, we're targeting starting a large like home study. So you would have to enroll in a study and accept all the risks and everything. But we'll do that within a year. Uh, and that'll be with like subscribers and people that are on like just on a waiting list, first come, first serve. Uh, and we're hoping to get up to 10,000 people into that study. And then after that, we'll submit to the FDA. So that'll be another year, something like two years before it's fully commercial is, is the current, that's the current timeline. Okay, great. I'm going to put in the chat some like who, who by, I've done a roundup of the sort of direct to consumer versions of these things in the past. Uh, it would be great mm -hmm. to have some stuff, of course. This is great. Cool. All right. Wonderful. Next one up. We yeah, have I think John. if you want to, if you oh. want something now, there's something called the Bloom in Europe, which does like a CRP test at home, for example, but you have to use it research use only in America. Yeah. And so people know in the meantime, there are, you don't have your doctor in the U.S. at least there are half a dozen, at least direct to consumer blood test vendors who will do the order for or Quest or LabCorp, and you can just, so if the Quest or LabCorp location are close and you don't mind the phlebotomist doing a full venous draw, those things are easily available and they're not that much more expensive than the price for the dried blood spot that, that you quoted here. So it's one test at $60, just like if you want just CRP or something like that. But I don't know, some of them can be cheaper. Right, Only your labs is pretty cheap. Dixon.com, when I did a roundup in 2016, was by far the cheapest. And they have a thing that's a super set of all the ones in your package for $250 per pop. Which one? The LifeExpension.com's Healthy Aging Comprehensive Panel. They go on sale regularly twice a year, at least for $175 a pop or something like that. On the order two yeah. the next. I'm sorry, but I would like to keep this conversation somewhat focused on the task of collecting the data, not just for yourself, but putting it together across many people and looking at data together. So the ease of collecting and sharing the data is very important, I think, not just. So what but the, what this topic brings up an important thing, which is maybe Cypox should enable not just integrating with Aura rings and Garmin watches, but also uploading PDFs of prior blood tests or done, ones done, ordered by the doctors, et cetera. We do. So you can upload 
at third party data. We haven't done like the chat GPT processing of PDFs yet. So you have to personally type in the data, but we'll do that. We'll do the OCR thing eventually. So you'll be able to put up your PDFs, but we do accept third party results. Perhaps I should say, I don't know if I should or not, but in our app, we will allow people to use their past blood results in their life so that they draw a curve of their age over time. Because what we did for non-intrusive measures, uh, because that's, I thought, what most people were interested in, but I agree that if you are really interested in health, you should combine non-intrusive and blood tests, because blood tests are very important too. So anyway, so what we did, we also did it in terms of math for any kind of health markers we could find, for example, on Enhance, which means that when we put our app online, you will be able to draw your past age, biological age curve, and based on your past blood samples, so when you saw the doctor, et cetera, and you will be able to annotate why you think your uh, biological age deferred from your chronology, so it will be your personal interpretation, but it will be shared so that you can use your past history to teach others. I, I think this is all very helpful. We unfortunately are running too close to the event in November, the foresight uh, vision weekend in November, but my hope is that this is going to be an annual occasion and the data will accumulate over the years and we're going, going to all stay healthy and alive and, and benefit from this data. Yeah, we also have a ton more questions. Is it okay if I'll just try to get a few more across? Uh, for example, Larry, you have your hand up. So why don't you go ahead? And then we have maybe Robert and... Yeah, yeah, yeah Michael, and I, I got in a little bit late on, on, on the call. I'm sorry about that. But yeah, I think that both of them are potential real toolkits to perform clinical trials in a different way. The big expense a lot of times to clinical trials is you have to go visit a place and they have to be set up to receive you, and and then and then the data has to be aggregated. And a lot of times at the FDA, usually we only have one lab to do a clinical trial because there's so much interlaboratory variability sometimes in, in, in measurements and things like yeah. that. Having the same apparatus that gives you the same values, I think, would be very good. And something that was at home would um, would would also be very good. There are certain tests that are just so inherently variable that but are very informative sometimes, especially longitudinally, that if, if you really like and see as is really probably the best biomarker for really impending death, but it's it's so difficult to measure very reliably from different labs. And so and D dimer is, is really important. And you really I, have to indicate I, I know who you are, but you should say that this is FDA. Yeah, think these would be the things that I think would, would be good, Leon, to, to really use I, yeah, the question, though. What is the question? The question is, are you, there's a shield program that's a, that FDA is running right now and part of that is really looking at laboratory testing and standardizing data collection. And are you familiar with it? Are you getting involved in it and things like that? There are a lot of industry so that data gets reported in a standardized mm -hmm. form. Would you drop a link into the chat box? And... Yeah, well, I will. Yeah. yeah are, are you involved that's... with it somehow? Or... And well, we try to do it. Yeah, at FDA. What we try to do in our system is everything that you measure, we like to identify what you're actually measuring, what are the critical reagents, that sort of thing, so that we have a handle on them. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're actually working on our pre-submission to the FDA submitting yeah. this yeah. month. So it'd be very interesting. I don't know, maybe we should talk about But I would also maybe try to get involved in a clinical trials space to, in Edward's system too, because to, those are the things people want to collect, that this type of data to see if something ever really works. May, may I share one thing of interest for site? Let's see. Pardon? We have 20 seconds. I'm going to share something. It's not published yet, but I guess it's useful. Okay, here. I'm just going to show the top. So this is, I think, the top markers for predicting mortality. And site C-statin C is clearly at the top. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have things like gate speed, and think you yeah. have things like Henry Four, right? And yeah, and most blood things are below, but site latency is clearly above uh, everything. Yeah, right. If you exclude people that are clearly that are like on dialysis, is that still true? Well, it, it gets you way before dialysis. What okay. happens with site C is that it actually mm -hmm. gets degraded in the kidney, and so if you see the red levels start to rise, that's a really bad sign. And when the kidneys start failing. 
everything else isn't far behind. So it's usually much more, it's usually before creatine and, and things like that. But the cytosine C is, is really the best marker. And then if you see it in the urine, then you really got a problem and, and the blood levels rise. So it really is probably, like you said, Edward, the, the, one of the best markers for imminent demise. Yeah. Let's see if we get one more question yeah. then, maybe from yeah. Robert Cargill. I think it's really nice to have a much higher C information. So the question is, if you want to see a shield here, or if you wanted to take multiple samples per day, what would it cost for someone to take in the single pitch for someone, as long as they took them all within a certain amount of time, you'd be able to pitch So that could have a kind of low enough chorus that you could afford to sample a high frequency. Yeah, we had a lot of requests for more free. Like we used to have a monthly, quarterly, and a yearly, and people would ask for how do I get more kits. So right now, our basic thing that we do is we send two kits. And once you use them, like you can use them same day, we ship two more and so on. But yeah, I mean, if there's real demand for a hundred at a time, certainly you can just message, just, just send us a message or something. We haven't had that many people ask for that. Or in this case, what you're saying to me, for me, it's, well, uh, really, it's intentional experiments every day. It's my to start training an algorithm in your subscriptions. Know for yourself which things you are doing are in. I think something the home device will enable that much more because the cost is just so much lower. And but yeah, it's if there's demand, we can definitely do that. It certainly sounds like there's a ton of demand. I'm going to close it out because we're already yeah. a minute over. But I just want to remind people that if you're interested in actually going and experimenting with this kind of with some supervision uh, of these guys, please do join Envision Weekend, especially the France one. And uh, they'll be there on September 17 and 19. You can see the whole schedule here, including when the sample drawing will be and including other folks who will be attending. There's also an application here for subsidized tickets for those of you who are junior researchers. So I'm just going to share the page here again. Also, if you want to share perhaps once more in the chat, the page where directly access the page, including the type form that you mentioned here, that would be really wonderful, mm -hmm. Michael. Then even everyone who can't join there in person can just get a headset on it. That would be great. So, is this going to be any? Allison for at the, I mean, I like France and, and everything. You know, if it's, it, it, is it going to be a topic to really look at setting up well, how we can set up uh, platforms to do this kind of thing or using yeah. some of these tools. Yeah. We do have an hour or an hour and a half allocated to it in the evening. And then there is on the Saturday evening. And then there's also a lot more time on Sunday, which is going to be really unstructured for people to really hash this out um, before we have closing presentations. And the good thing is whatever you guys discuss in France, will make it also to the San Francisco version of Vision Weekend because that's two weeks later. So we can get more people in the US also like interested in whatever you guys hammer out there. <clears throat> yeah, definitely a ton of space of vision we can do. Okay, thank you everyone for joining. This was really, really fun. Um, and I, just, I can't I just wait to make a note. Sorry, I started yeah. to interrupt. Yeah, please, like we give your closing we, words. Give your closing words. We didn't words. cover this as well as I had hoped. I, I think Leon and I somehow lost it between us. The hope that people will take a test a month before, like two weeks before going there, do an experiment on themselves and then test again at the conference. Pick so, an experiment, change your diet, take a supplement, whatever you think you're taking in men right? and see if it has any effects, any positive or negative effects. So I think that would be really exciting because if you take one test, it's not going to have that same power as two tests. And that's the hope that people will, will do that. But one test is interesting too, but not, not to the same degree. We do, well, have, we like, do have some people that come from France Vision Weekend to US Vision Weekend. So they definitely have the time to kind of take something too. Uh, you'll still, if you connect your wearable, you'll get the month and of data before your test so you can at least correlate that but if you want to do an experiment it's better to do a test and then test again that's obviously better than one test anyway i just wanted to get that out to, to be clear it's also in the type forms course cool let's see how many cats we can hurt to be able to do that and um, prior division we can 
Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Really appreciate it. Really exciting effort. I can't wait to see the next virtual one and in-person vision weekend in just maybe a little over a month from now. So thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.